without any further ado, I'm going to um, step back and hand over to Phil Dolling. He will introduce himself and our speakers, and he's going to act as moderator for this session. And I'll see everyone else towards the end of the hour, which will finish at 11.30. Thank you. Hello there. Good morning, everybody. I'm Phil Dolling. Um, my background is mainly in live television and documentary making. Um, I worked for the BBC for many years, and I've just started to discover more about virtual production, which is quite honestly stunning. And I was lucky enough to get to the ARRI um, Open Day a few uh, weeks ago now, which was run by uh, Screen Skills. And to see a, a major, a major installation like that, uh, as it were, in the flesh is a, is a really inspiring experience. And lots and lots of interesting ideas came out of it. Now, today, we've got a pack session with four um, pioneers, I think, is the best way to describe everybody, because uh, the word expert at the moment is slightly shunned in the world of virtual production because it's so much in its infancy. Expertise is, is probably, we're not quite at that level yet. It's not quite, um, uh, how could you say, uh, well-defined enough, but pioneers is certainly the right word. And each comes from a very different uh, world, which is interesting in itself because what we're trying to learn today is how these different worlds are converging. So we have Sarah Cox, who comes from a, a live background like myself. Uh, she works for White Light. She's uh, head of sales innovation. We have his son, who has a background in games, VFX, and then moved on to become head of VFX at Rebellion Films, working in films himself. Alan Rankin, who works in R&D, who's managing director of Target 3D, um, who does fascinating work in the area of uh, VP, but mainly in R&D. And then we have Lisa Gray, who's an executive producer who's made films and programs all over the world and is just beginning to uh, try and work out how to use VP for storytelling. So it's a, it's a great group of people, all from very different backgrounds. And we'll hear from each of them individually. There'll be plenty of time for questions at the end, but we'll start with Sarah Cox, as I say, a, a background in live effects, started out uh, quite fascinatingly working at the comedy store in London as stage manager and then went on to Wembley and has now worked all the way through to working at White Light as um, head of uh, sales innovation. And she will uh, tell you a bit about herself and how she's working in VP. So over to her. Okay. Thanks, Phil. Um, so I guess, firstly, it would be uh, to say thanks very much to Screen Skills for, for bringing me onto this, such a great panel as well. So I'm looking forward to just uh, spending some time with you now and explaining kind of how, how I got into this industry, um, why, why our skills are relevant in, in virtual production. Um, and, and particularly what White Light's doing in that space as one of the pioneering companies behind the XR, extended reality and the tool sets we use. Um, I've been working in the live event industry for, for 20 years um, and I really come from, from theatre, that's, that's my background. Um, I studied a, a degree um, in, in technical theatre with live, um, sorry, lighting set and an audio um, and I got my first job out of university as a stage manager and I worked at the comedy store. Um, in doing that, I had a lot of skills uh, very quickly on the audio side of the industry. So I followed that path and went off and, uh, and helped build Wembley Stadium from a uh, public address voice alarm system point of view. Uh, I spent some time doing CAD plans and running that project and that was kind of fun, but I really miss live. Uh, so I went off to work for PRG, which is a, a service company. And there I really focused on the West End. I spent a lot of my time working with shows like Avenue Q, Lion King, Wicked. Um, and, and that was a lot of fun, predominantly focused around lighting I'm a bit of a geek at heart. Um, in my private time, I spend way too much time with tech and gadgets and software. Um, and so working in the live event world, I was very passionate about the technology itself. And I had a great opportunity to join a company called TMB, um, which is a, a global distribution company and they represent technology brands. Um, so I spent quite a few years with them, adopting new technologies, rolling those out and introducing those techs to customers. And I loved it. At the same time, I was introduced to video and the emerging media industry. Um, it was very much at the time a, a 2D world um, and in the live scene it was stock content so if you had anyone making content it was either pre-rendered it was all pre-rendered um, it was either something very expensive that had been made custom or it was stock content that you could upload live onto onto the pixels um, it was very low resolution at this time um, so it really was all around uh lighting products being used as low resolution LED mapping. Um, but it fundamentally was the emerging video industry as we know it today in the live sector. And I worked at the time with Green Hippo, one of the very well respected media server brands out there. 
from there at the same time, what we were seeing in live was an emerging world of 3D mapping or projection mapping. Um, and we were putting pixels on everything that was, was, wasn't moving until it did start moving. And then we put pixels on that as well. Uh, but what we really wanted to do as an industry was define some workflows that enabled content to find its way to objects, whether it was 3D or 2D, um, physical objects that are static or moving, um, and that emerging world required the, the invention of 3D engines that could manage these pixels and these graphics um, packages. Again, we're all really talking about pre-rendered content <coughs> at this stage. So I joined um, Disguise, which is uh, D3 Technologies at the time, um, and they were very much focused on uh, creating a 3D environment that enabled you to see the entire production at the same time as creating um, a mapping technology that took those pixels and mapped them into the 3D world. At the same time as, as working in the projection world, we were starting to see the emergence of real-time content technologies. Um, and in the live scene, Notch was that, that, that engine that we saw. And it was about creating real-time motion graphics on the top of live camera effects. And it was an explosion in 2016 to 2018. Um, we really saw an explosion of the use of real-time content in live video, and it was huge. Um, and it was kind of exciting and it meant that LED resolutions got bigger, volumes or, or LED walls that we call them in the live industry, they became really large canvases um, and real-time engines started to become a thing. We saw the emergence of real-time artists. Um, off the back of that, um, what we were starting to see was scenography or pixels and media becoming part of the scenic element rather than just being on screens outside of the set or at the side of the stage. We were seeing that video become immersive in the production itself. But it became a lot more than just being used as an iMag or a, a camera effects box. Real-time tools were starting to be used to create motion graphics, truly quite elegant motion graphics. It was speeding up the artists and production pipeline. We saw these very early demos from Unity, which was Adam. Um, Unreal Engine was coming into the scene and Notch was doing what it was doing with um, the VFX world of motion graphics. So I really wanted to be part of that. Um, and I used those skills to join Notch in 2019 uh, to focus on that motion graphics pipeline that was happening. Um, at the same time as that, obviously we, we hit the pandemic, um, but people in the live scene were using the real-time tools to start looking at how they could be used in broadcast environments. Uh, that was kind of the first place that we really started. Um, and we'll come back to why I joined Whiteline. And really the two things that were happening at the same time was virtual production using large LED volumes and real-time content and extended reality using LED volumes and real-time content. Exactly the same tool sets were emerging in these markets. Um, and for white light, really predominantly, we, we pioneered in 2017 the use of LED volumes, real-time content and tracking in a broadcast situation. And it did all start with the idea of this LED cube that you can see on the left. This was the Eurosport Discovery LED cube. And when we came back from that, we went into an R&D project with um, a few industry partners to really figure out how we could take what we'd learned by creating these immersive LED volumes, but making them feel like a much bigger environment. And I guess this is one of the differences between a virtual production volume and a broadcast extended reality solution is that we've got small spaces. So this was the Russia World Cup with the very first use in the world of the set extension technology, where we take a small LED volume and we add a virtual set extension around it so that it creates a truly immersive world that's extended. So at the top of this image, that's actually a fake um, augmented reality layer stuck on top. And at the bottom behind the, the presenters, that's the real uh, view from a camera. So it's quite exciting to see what these technologies were doing. And uh, we were actually doing more and more stuff with figuring out during pandemic how to do teleports, how could we bring people from Australia live into a studio with a presenter in London. So this whole immersive cube technology and extended reality became um, very overnight the go-to tool for bringing broadcasters and, uh, and sports personalities together. So White Light's been doing this for a very long time, since 2017, pioneering extended reality. Um, and as you can see here, this is the ITV Euro set where we start looking at how we mix a physical set with a virtual environment. Um, and that we think will take us into the future when we talk about hybrid events and immersive experience. But we at White Light see a use for these tools, not just in virtual production for filmmaking and broadcast, 
but in education, in, in TV broadcast sports comedy. We're looking at corporate use cases now of how brands and uh, corporate communications can use this as a presentation technology. And it really is exploding. Um, I'd just like to finish off with showing you a really brief video of all of the work that we've been doing over the last year um, and how those extended reality tools are being applied in the corporate world. So this is actually from, uh, that first image was from our stage in London, where we host real corporate uh, clients to do their presentations. This is Eurosport coming from our Studio 15 three by three cube. We did the gadget show to try and introduce XR technology, uh, the world's first broadcast uh, using real time extension. As you can see over the last year, we've been bringing in clients from all over the world um, using all sorts of different types of uh, technology, such as virtual reality, um, to try and really give people a brand new presentation tool. But we do see the way that the world has, has changed. Um, sustainability, getting onto flights. Um, CEOs don't want to travel all around the world anymore to do presentations. So this virtual production world, I guess my, my job today was just to say that it's not just about film production, it's about um, how we're actually expanding the use of virtual production technologies and extended reality in use cases um, across many multiple sectors. Thank you very much indeed. But um, let me just ask you one question because it's so interesting to see your personal journey, but what's possible in this world? And do you think there's now career opportunities that could, in an almost perfect world, mean you would be touring with Ed Sheeran during the summer and then doing extended reality television or virtual reality film production in, in the winter? And all those skills sort of start to overlap. Absolutely. Um, the, the key team behind creating the XR technology for White Light, the smart stage, um, they work on everything from one, net, one day a live event to a virtual production volume to going on tour with Ed Sheeran. Their skill sets for media servers, for, for running LED volumes, mm -hmm. um, they are very much cross industry. That's why we are seeing that merge of those yeah. skill sets crossing over, for sure. Because it's, it's a very exciting proposition. It also means that you have that if, if for one reason or another, and we've all seen uh, during COVID different sectors of our industry having to close down, it means there's still, you know, it safeguards your employment to some extent as certain sectors expand and others for one reason or another might have to diminish. You can always find interesting work in your field, which I think is, which is brilliant. Let's be honest. It's fantastic. Um, I'm going to hold it there. We can ask more questions of you later. I'm going to move on now to, to Sun and Sun has a very different background and say so everyone comes from very different backgrounds. His is started off really in VFX in games and then expanded out into some amazing film productions. I think it's right in saying mainly in landscape as well. And he's now got the enviable job as head of VFX for Rebellion Film Studios. And I've been out to the new installation, but well, it's more than an installation, it's about the size of the Tate Modern in um, in Didcot, which promises to be fantastic when it's all up and running. Um, but anyway, let me hand over to Sun and he can tell you all about himself and what he's doing in virtual production. Thanks, Phil. Hi, everyone. I'm Andy Sun. So uh, I'm going to prepare a little quick uh, uh, presentation for you guys as well. I promise I'm going to be super quick and then I'm going to play a video. And this presentation is pretty much like, you know, representative of how the computer graphic uh, was evolved in the last 14 years, over a decade. Uh, time started from a PlayStation uh, 2 time and all the way to uh, visual effects and also nowadays how the virtual production is emerging both technology together. Um, so I started my um, degree, I graduated in 2008 um, uh, in University of Kent. Um, in Canterbury, lovely campuses, you know, very beautiful scenery. And uh, when I graduated, uh, I go straight into a company called Eurocom uh, as the uh, visual effects artist there. Uh, back in the time, the you know there wasn't a PlayStation for that was PlayStation Two at the time. The first game I ever worked on uh, was Ice Age Three at that time. Uh, it was a movie adapted games, and that's how I kind of you know, got into. Uh, the, the visual effects for the games, making things like exploding, things, uh, destructions, and or to a spawn effects, you know, uh, or muzzle flashes. 
and things like that. And then um, I I also more worked on things like you know we uh, when you have like motion control system that you can point in your guns into a certain place and shoot. Um, I st stayed in the games for about roughly ten years times and worked on about ten plus games and. Um, uh, there was a turning point um, in the game industry where the PlayStation VR, what the VR things was a big thing at the time. You know, uh, I uh, luckily involved uh, in one of the launch site tour for PlayStation VR in 2016. Um, at that time, people was am just amazed by the technology itself. You put the headsets on. You're fully immersive in the environment. So you can walk around, you can look around, you know, you can interact with the object in the virtual world. And then that was a you know the biggest thing ever. That we everyone was like amazed by the technology itself. And then we start to think, oh, you know, this is the originally based on the game technology, but is there anything we can bring in to for the other industry to use it as well? So um all of this technology that we're talking about is obviously coming from a game which is based on a game engine. So we have obviously, you know, there's Unreal Engine, you know, on the market, there's Unity Engine, but there's also some proprietary engine that made by a company like Ubisoft or a company like EA in like a for um, you know uh Biforest and all Snowdrop. And this engine was used in like Battlefield or um uh, division. Um, then I, after the game industry in 10 plus years, I started uh, to move into the films industry by bringing some of the game technology that I, that in the last 10 years that I have been experiencing. So the first project that I worked on uh, when I moved to visual effects, luckily was a Lion King, which is a recreation of the entire uh, Quorum you know, the old, old, uh, old Lion Kings. What we've we done this time differently is again, as you can see that John Favreau was wearing the headset, which is essentially the VR technology that we previously explored in the game industry. And where he filmed or he can virtually sculpt the CG environment set, how the Pride or Pride Land is looking and cleverly planning his shoot or camera angle and how he wanted to film the film. And then eventually they filmed the entire films in the Unity engine. And then MPC took the Unity engine previous and uh, made it uh, super photorealistic and beautiful. And that technology has been used in previous since then for all the uh, you know, majority of the, a lot of the films that have been made so far. Um, then we are plus game engine plus everything, you know, we, First time I was involved in Mandalorians. Um, then that's when I first time saw the LED volumes was actually used in, in the film productions as, as VFX, as a tool. Um, traditionally, you would have the green screen. And uh, because like, obviously when you have an armor, you know, you, the green screen would reflect onto the armor. You have to cause a lot of problems in a post that you have to, you know, deal with where you have the beauty of the, you have the LED wall that you project the Unreal Engine um, content onto the wall where you get all the lightings and uh, all the interactions and stuff that which we call the in-game, in-camera visual effects. Um, after the couple of years in visual effects industry, I went, I came back to Rebellion um, after about three years time. Um, I created a new uh, team, which is a um, visual effects team at the Ribbon Film Studio. Uh, you, essentially, I wanted to bring the game technology and what I learned in the films together using the real-time technology to create, uh, to create uh, more films and more content, TV or animations. So where we have this amazing facility, which has multiple sound stages and uh, people are, are here doing motion captures and virtual productions and, uh, and normal field production. And this is the sum of the stages that we have um, in house. So uh, this last year summer, uh, myself also filmed a little Percival uh, short, which is a virtual production at EWO in conjunction with uh, NBS. Um, 
with audio motion with camera tracking system from Wacom, which is pretty amazing. I'm going to show you this little video, which uh, representing the key thing to look at in this video is like to, to see how the computer graphic was involved in the pretty much last 14 years of time. Thank you very much son that's amazing it's so interesting to see that timeline which frankly is very recent really is to 2010 to, to today and everything has changed so much in that time and also it seems like in the last two or three years there's been such a such a, a shift you know it's like everything's gone up almost almost since Lion King in a way I know it's not quite that simple but it's amazing how much it's changed it's also fair to say when I said Didcot was the size of the Tate Modern, as you can see, I wasn't exaggerating. It's absolutely enormous. It's, I, I'd be fascinated to see what you'd be able to do with all that space. But um, I'm going to move on. I, I would like to introduce now Alan Rankin, who's the Managing Director of Target 3D, who, again, has a very different background in uh, hologram creation, motion capture, gaming, you name it. And what I find interesting about Alan's work is, in some ways, but he'll be able to explain better for himself. He kind of underpins a lot of what's going on in virtual production because what he's doing is the R&D development so that other people can then take it on and use it in a new and interesting way. So I'll hand over to him. Over to you, Alan. Myself, you know, my, my personal career in terms of a career path came from a very traditional IT background. Um, uh, Office networks, Microsoft, that kind of thing. Uh, but we got into um, motion capture from a previous uh, job at a company called Anition. And at that time, we were doing technology consultancy, got into motion capture. And motion capture is quite an interesting um, field or sector. It applies to lots and lots of different industries. So you've got here a snapshot of everywhere where people need 3D motion tracking or 3D tracking. And it's usually very, very high accuracy in terms of position and rotation. And it can apply to all these different kinds of industries. So everyone here is quite well aware of animation VFX and film and TV production, but also biomechanics and life movement sciences, um, training and simulation integration, robotics, and, and on and on. I suppose um, how we got into virtual production was coming from a standpoint of our traditional business, which is mocap cameras, people in suits with markers on, being acquired and tracked. Um, so this is a very traditional kind of motion capture lab, which we typically fabricate um, to bring these systems into more interesting places where people want to do much more technical uh, motion captures. So this is a project we're doing with a Swedish company called Hudafugel, and they do trapeze and, and um, circus artistry and, and really quite technical movements where we've set up motion capture systems. 
Um, and from here, uh, here's another example. So this is a power wall, a multi, multi stereo power wall um, at Liverpool University, where you can just see that the motion capture 3D tracking is being done on the operator's headset. So um, you can just kind of make out the two people standing at the front there wearing glasses with 3D targets and are being tracked. And there's Liam, one of our installation engineers, showing this kind of a bit more. Uh, graphically where we track the wand, we track the headset, and this um, enables you to re-render the content within an immersive environment in real time. Um, so kind of another take on how you might want to look at virtual production. And so then, you know, more and more this convergence of technologies um, means that you can do a lot more. And I think Sarah's presentation showed a lot of that, right, in terms of you can have people in a green screen environment, you can motion capture them, and then you can apply that captured data into different engines, you know, Unreal Engine, Unity. And so everything is kind of starting to um, be a lot more interoperable in terms of the technologies. Uh, this is a project we did with um, Consortium, um, and this was Liam Payne being motion captured in real time, it was at the uh, BAFTAs awards and people were able to consume this from, uh, the consumers were able to download an app on the e-mobile phone network and then see Liam Payne augmented reality projected onto your table in front of you. Um, so these are kind of some of the whole kind of ways in which we're getting into virtual production. Um, and you mentioned about the R&D, so if I could just expand on that. We have in Guildford, um, in, in sorry, a virtual production test stage, which we set up with the Digital Catapult. And this initiative is really to test um, technology combinations and software workflows and how people might want to use virtual production based on some assumptions, based on industry knowledge. And we're testing all these um, combinations and then reporting it back into industry um, via Digital Catapult. So. We can answer some of the questions which people have about what are the best uh, combinations to use given certain scenarios um, and as part of that whole endeavor which we've been embarking upon for the last uh, six or eight months um, we are also finding that there's a big um, necessity to understand the the skills requirements for different people in different uh, parts of this virtual production um, you know creating virtual production, um, using virtual production to create um, pieces um, requires so many different skill sets. And this endeavor with digital, digital catapult at the test stage is um, enabling us to, to work out and understand where those skills are, you know, be it from lighting, uh, from camera operators, from disguise operators, from Unreal user uh, operators. So th there's a huge kind of variation there. Um, and so, th this is a, an example. This is a, um, a project which White Light um, did this XR stage at Verizon. And um, we've got um, some motion capture being used in this stage as well for kind of real time performance. Um, I'll just play this, uh, this video. And this is a good example of how these technologies kind of now coming together. Now to the sounds of Mr. Rock, 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 the funky beats with the brother DJ A skill. With A-Skills and Crafty Cuts, we've got two performers who've worked with us across a number of different projects. The guys love Monkey Shoulder, which is really important to us. Like for mixing, it goes back to the origins of why we created Monkey Shoulder um, as a Scotch whiskey that was made for mixing. Nothing tells the vibe better than the music and the soundtrack. And so we've always worked with, with DJs and partners that kind of have that made for mixing vibe about them, which is funk and breaks and, and DJs that mix different tracks and things together. The Central End came to us for a media partner. As an experiential brand, we've done merchandise and the opportunities of wearable technology and the NFT technology is what excited me and inspired me to be as part of this project. From Unreal. So today we've been shooting our motion capture DJ sets for Decentraland, playing the after party for Monkey Shoulder, and it's been pretty insane. Hey! Monkey Shoulder. 
Whiskey Shodder targets a younger crowd of consumers, obviously of legal drinking age, but people who might already be present in Decentraland or part of it. Seeing all these festivals appearing in a whole new setting in the virtual world felt like a natural segue for us to take the brand in there and see how we could shake up that space and do something new and learn a little bit more about the metaverse. It, it blows my mind because it, it doesn't look anything like a shoot I've ever done before, you know. Um, so I've never seen anything like this before. And you're trying to keep on moving around to keep it sort of entertaining. Like, it actually was like doing a little workout, wasn't it? Yeah, I was obviously exhausted. <laughs> I'm actually exhausted right now. But it was an experience that I'll never forget because it was unique. Adam's got the skills when it comes to like writing say? music and engineering and scratching <laughs> and stuff like that. I feel like there's a butt coming. And I've got the skills when it comes to like dancing and, and, and kind of like getting people, you know, hyped and, and making people smile, putting a smile on people's faces. The two of us together, it's a little unique experience. What's up, Decentraland? Welcome to the Monkey Shoulder After Party. I made skills. This is my man, Crafty Cuts. Let's go. It's an area that people seem interested in, but nobody really knows enough about it. So you kind of have to jump off the cliff together, don't you? And luckily they said, yeah. It is mind blowing. And I mean, I can't wait to actually attend the festival as a sort of punter, like in the crowd and see what it's like experiencing it from that end. There's going to be less of these mega festivals around the world. And if people genuinely can have a, a, an, an experience in something like the metaverse, then we want to be at it. The possibilities in the metaverse are endless. I think it's just an exciting space and I think I, I'm just really keen for us to be part of that journey and seeing where it's going to go in the future. And to see all of the screens and all of the tech. Yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm in an episode of Tomorrow's World from, from the late 90s. <laughs> Thank you, Decentraland. Big shout out to Monkey Shoulder. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for coming see there kind of a, a live metaverse performance using motion capture in a green screen environment, tracking decks, tracking the operator, bringing in brands. This is kind of virtual production in addition to the LED backdrops. So that there's quite a myriad of, of, uh, of ways in which you could term something as virtual production. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much, Alan. It's, it is great just to see what's happening across the range of virtual production. It's very easy and it sometimes captures the imagination because the new volumes are so huge and, and let's be honest, impressive, especially if you visit them, to think that that's, that's the beginning and end of what virtual production is and can do. And it's just wonderful to see the range of work from uh, television to um, metaverse broadcasts, et cetera, that you can do with it. And on that note, I shall hand over now to Lisa Gray, who's executive producer with Bill Studios. I mean, she's got a fantastic background in film and program making, has worked in uh, markets in the UK, the US, Australia, you name it. And now she's uh, working virtual production. So I'll, I'll leave it to her to explain what she's been doing and what she's up to. Thank you very much. Um... My name is Lisa, um, and thank you Screen Skills for inviting me to be part of this educational opportunity. Um, when I used to go to these conversations about VFX or virtual production as a producer from a more traditional sense, I used to be intimidated. As you can imagine, I mean, Sarah, he, and the last um, presentation had incredible technical detail, and I got a C in computer studies at university. Um, but because um, of my career and my interest in audience engagement, that's how I've ended up having technology as the center of my career. Um, so for me, my main goal today is to show all of you on the call that getting into virtual production is possible. Um, and as Sarah and Phil said, it's really, really new media form, but it's growing and changing all the time. And it's more accessible than you think. I'll go through a little bit about my career that led me to the work that I'm doing at Mars. Um, I, uh, and as a producer, I'll introduce the facility, decode the definitions of virtual production going on that we hear often, and, um, and some producer tips that I've worked out so far um, in my five month career doing virtual production producing. <laughs> um, so a little bit more about me. Um, uh, so my name is Lisa, and I would like to say that I look, 20, I look pretty young for my 25 years of experience. Being audience first, I've always based my creative on what the audience wants. I've ended up being an interactive entertainment expert and has 
computers a big part of my career, despite getting a C for computer studies, as I said. To get there, though, I spent a good 10 to 15 years trying as many different genres to work out what I wanted to specialise in. Um, and then at the end of that experience, because in Australia, it's like you do sport or you do drama or you do reality. I got to the end of 10 years and realised I liked them all. Um, and I just like storytelling. Um, so, you know, and then at the end, yeah, it was the opportunities of working within original content initiatives on Snapchat, Facebook Watch, VR, and now virtual production that, that led me to this, this kind of mold, this hybrid career. And with everything I see coming through Mars, I'm grateful of my, for my diverse experience. Um, and as Sarah's saying, Beyond Media is using this technology to evolve their business. Media, I've learned, is an industry building industry and virtual production will end up opening more doors to your career than, 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 than media. The other thing I do is I've been lucky enough to be a member of the, um, of the Academy in the innovation category since 2016. This has put me front row to what people across the world are doing in interactive entertainment. To be honest, the nerd in me has been often underwhelmed with um, the potential of what people have submitted till about last year. The streamers are now creating more engaging storytelling. Um, we saw that with Bandersnatch, we've seen that with Interactive, and now I'm really excited about Netflix ja um, games um, being launched a couple of weeks ago. Um, virtual production has brought more, brings more people like me, the people who've been in a show, in a, in a, in a, a storytelling room, people who've been filming art documentaries, um, to a gaming environment because of this unreal opportunity. And that's where I'm challenging you all to embrace it. So the space I work at is um, Mars. Now Mars um, has been set up with a goal to make virtual production more accessible. A lot of the people that have come to our business have often gone, I can't do virtual production because it costs too much. I need a Hollywood budget. So the two founders of Mars actually set it up to show that you know, more people can use it and should consider it as an opportunity. Um, for me, one of the most exciting things about virtual production is that it rolls up the previous linear production processes and television into a dynamic production world. Most radically traditional post-production roles, skills and processes have moved into pre-production and onset, whilst at the same time they retain a role of final fault, final polish or film release. Um, we have only been open since August and we are a facility out in South Ryslip and um, we, our virtual production offers both unreal um, um, capabilities but often um, but also backplates and green screen. What I found really interesting um, as I've been working there is that a lot of our clients will come in and think that they need to realise their creative in an unreal way or green screen way but very, you know, only open since August, we very quickly changed our approach with clients to getting people to bring in their, their brief, getting understanding what people were trying to achieve and then offering a solution. And that's, and that's something that we found incredibly essential as this new, new um, our culture and new world is finding its feet. Understanding what media, what VP can mean to many media industries. As I mentioned earlier, it's been really interesting um, to cater to clients and then learning very quickly that people have very, very different understandings of virtual production. Um, for me, it's, um, you know, people have, there's some people that think the industry is a revolution, but I think but what I've been very, very mindful of is showing people that it's an evolution, not a revolution. Um, that virtual production is not going to be the be all and end all of all production solutions. I have I have been at this trend before. Um, VR, at one, you know, when I was working in VR was going to be the thing that was gonna solve all our problems. And I think the first mistake you can make is that a new technology can do that and a new way can do that. I think there is so many, so much benefit to bringing production skills from other areas into influence and then just see, then lead, use virtual production as a tool rather than the everything. 
I, um, there's, I am really excited about the versatility that we have with creativity and we are only starting to scratch the surface. Um, and the more our languages between different creatives from different industries start to align and we start to understand each other, as I said, with the Emmys categories, I've definitely seen the opportunity of how storytelling or how immersive worlds can, can work. Um, I think the sustainability factor is really, really important when looking at the difference between a studio shoot or a location shoot and a virtual production shoot. Uh, one of my colleagues, Joanne, uh, shared me a statistic a couple of, a couple of, about a month ago now, where she said a typical tentpole film production of 54 million budget produces on average 2,800 tonnes of CO2. BP helps reduce the three major contributions to this CO2 um, with, from diesel generators for location, shipping and travel for film units, raw materials of building large sets. So I think in the world where we're all becoming an importantly more conscious about sustainability, this is something to consider. Um, personally, I found the location control really, really great when it comes to virtual production. Um, I've had challenges in the past of shooting night for day, um, safety challenges with blocking down streets when we've done camera shoots um, and, and, you know, uh, also not shooting to multiple locations for product shoots. We've had in the studio a couple of advertising um, uh, agencies come in and do a car shoot that they would have traveled to seven or eight locations and they're doing it all from our studio. And I also think there's an opportunity with the control of how the location looks like. Um, only last year I did a shoot in Inverness and uh, you know we had, you know, sillyly it was supposed to, we, there was written a script for not raining, but it rained the whole time. <laughs> and so I think there's, the, the, that's the great thing about you know, you get the creative to work within the virtual production situation, and then you also have more control of it. Um, also, your content in the studio has an opportunity for interactivity that is syn synchronistic more than uh, uh, other opportunities I've had to work with that. Um, I went uh, to a Story Futures um, conversation and, you know, Epic opened the conversation with every piece of content can have a game engine behind it. Um, so even though we know that now, the more creatives start to embrace that, I think we're going to reimagine more than ever how we see storytelling and how we see engaging content. Um, one, some of these are some of the things that I've learned uh, when it's come to what producers should think about when they look um, at VP as an option. Um, as I mentioned earlier, is an Unreal Engine content background necessarily a right solution? Um, often people can get caught up in buzzwords or may have read a definition of what an offering could be and not fully understand it. I'd strongly suggest that you come to a studio or your content creators and say to them, this is what I need, and then use their expertise to guide you to the right solution, because often it's a more cost effective one, um, which leads me on to my next point. VP may not be as cost effective as you think. But if you have the right team around you, it can work in your favour as you minus other elements you would have spent money on and add it to virtual production. Test days with your content before the shoot in a volume are more crucial. One of the often misnomers or challenges that I help traditional television producers get around is they usually go into a studio, set up and it's done. That's not the case with virtual production. Absolutely consider the testing of your content in the volume and also use that as a learning and education opportunity. See how it's received, see how it's lit, see what you need to work around that and testing days are crucial. And it just means your shoot days will run a lot smoother. Um, have your crew worked with virtual and real scenarios in tandem on set before? Um, I saw a, um, a, some, some content from Screen Schools yesterday that talked about the need for more skills that consider both. People are still learning this, so be patient with it, but it's definitely a new way of approaching your career as a set designer, as someone in VFX, and so make sure they're all considered. Um, hierarchy on set is really important. We have now new people on set making key decisions. So when you work in this situation, it's not your traditional way of making television or film, um, but make sure that that's all set up in pre-production. Speaking of, Technology, techniques and workflows are changing all the time rapidly. 
definitely get this straight with your, your partners and make sure the workflow considers the new voices on set and also make sure you all collectively work that out. Um, which brings me to my next point. VP has created new roles and created a demand for upskilling positions, get learning. Um, the best way I believe you could learn is, oh, hang on, excuse me, oh, there it is, is, is come to go into a volume, go and experience for yourself. Um, since we've been more open, it's made a market of difference to get people into our space um, and to, so they can reimagine firsthand how their virtual production situation can look. Um, there is no, one of the definite things I lean on in my career that's fast speeding up in virtual production is common sense and communication and, and also just getting your hands on the tools. Um, at Mars, we have a couple of different learning points. One of them that has been really important in when we've been you know, working with clients has been, we have a 90 minutes on Mars where you can come in, you can play with the tools and you can talk to some of our experts. Look for those opportunities as we're all learning together. And yeah, thank you. I hope you've, you're less intimidated about virtual production. Here's my contact details and um, I look forward to hearing from you. Brilliant. Look, first of all, thank you so yeah, much indeed. everyone. That was really useful. Um, there's a, a question for Alan that came in, uh, if I can just find it. Do you think that new cameras and kit are going to be needed to accommodate the, the, the development of virtual production, which is moving so, so fast? Anyone can jump in. Yeah, I mean, the answer is yes there. And there are some interesting um, things coming along. DJI have got an interesting camera, which uh, um, I think it's just the lenses on the gimbal to enable a lot more. Uh, flexibility and movement within uh, a stage but everything you know like lots of um all evolution of electronics these days you know the, the walls are getting smaller the pixel pictures are getting smaller which means you can do more interesting um setups in terms of curves um the camera is getting high resolution so they can see more pixels so you have to counterbalance all these things but yeah i mean people are creating new tools um hardware tools all the time for VP applications. So it is, yeah. it is evolving naturally. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I, I just um, say from, you know, our screen skills perspective, it's not just cameras, it's it's across the board, it's all hardware and all software. And actually, the, you know, the interesting thing is there's incredibly innovative product developers and owners out there. So at the moment, it's a little bit niche sometimes, but I think increasingly that's going to kind of democratize unless anyone disagrees with me in the panel. Yeah, it's, it's the knitting together of these things, which is the complex part, right? So exactly. a lot of these of, of themselves are really good, but when you need to use them in virtual production, you have to make them all mm -hmm. sync and talk and lock. And those are the, mm -hmm. the, the issues we keep coming up against. Um, another question that came through, uh, I know what I would say to this, but anyone in the panel, how has COVID changed virtual production? And I guess that, you know, one of the, the uh, prompt bit, do you think it's accelerated or changed the direction of Sarah's nodding? So I'll hand over to Sarah initially. Yeah, hundred percent. We, we started this journey in like 2016, um, using virtual production techniques and just it was too expensive people couldn't understand why you wouldn't want to be physically there and there was a lot of obstacles for us to overcome at the same time as trying to invent an r&d this thing um, and then covid came and suddenly the understanding of what a volume can do what set environment what environmental content can do how xr um, is used that that understanding became accelerated and people started to go well we haven't got anything else so let's give this a try let's go into a volume let's go into an XR broadcast studio um, and acceptance has, has gone from there really um, so definitely greater understanding much rapid uh, much more rapid understanding across the industry is how I feel personally brilliant yeah. I'm, I'm going to move on because unless anyone disagrees with that point no, um, no I'm just going to agree <laughs> Um, okay, so another question, which I'm happy to talk about, actually, because I I, um, I asked this, uh, but Lisa, you'll get this. Ha has, um, I cannot answer about the training. Somebody saying script supervisors. Is the training to help continuity script supervisors adapt to the world of VR, LED and location filming? 
Did you want to answer that, Emma, or should I? Well, what I would say, interestingly, I've spent, and Phil knows this, a great deal of time picking out what roles have changed because of uh, VP and what roles really haven't. And interestingly, and I'll stand corrected, very experienced and old uh, supervisor friend of mine, I asked her, she'd just done uh, a big VR, uh, VP enabled shoot it wasn't the whole of it and she said actually remarkably little changed Lisa would you agree yeah it has but I think that's indicative to the fact that the industry is still quite young I mean um, it's hard to yes. see that when we're kind of all the people on the panel are in it but I'm reminded by some of the clients we have coming in that I used to work with five years ago who are like wow this is all so new so I think that will change further yeah. down the track but I think that's at the moment not not so much. But because yeah, I think yeah. I am screen skills, there's an opportunity there. <laughs> oh, totally, and I'll talk about it a bit in a few seconds, actually, uh, about what next. But yeah, I think it will as more data runs through and gets gets um, funneled in one certain direction. I'm sure that will fall to the script supervisor very much to be part of that team. Does a virtual production have to take place in a specialist studio, or? Can you do a pop-up VP stage? Who'd like to take that one? Okay, I can. Yeah, you can. You can do a pop-up VP stage. Um, Mars is a permanent studio, but Build, who are the skill set that power Mars, have been setting up pop-up stages. They're actually set up one at Apple, um, and they're doing the follow-up to Band of Brothers, um, and they're also doing another one um, at the Warner Brothers studio. So, yes, you can. It's just very expensive. Um, so if you've got the budget, go for it. Um, but just make sure you factor in the setup and pull down. It's not just hiring a studio. Yeah. One of the things we saw, um, I just love to add to that. One of the things we saw during the, the pandemic from a um, motion graphic side was artists creating their own shows from home. Um, and without any green screen technology, using NVIDIA developments like background removal, um, skeletal tracking, virtual production doesn't have to be in an LED volume. You can create a virtual production from your room using um, tools that are existing on graphics cards and other technologies to remove backgrounds, create, put yourself into virtual worlds. That's really exciting because you can start playing with the tools before you even need to get to that sort of high end um, wraparound technology that's involved as well. Somebody's asking, I think, essentially, what's the main skills you look for when hiring somebody in to work in virtual production? I know that's depend, huge. Depend which, which area he wanted to do, exactly. right? Whether, <laughs> it's like whether you want to do a technical side on stage or you want to do a content creation side, I guess, like if, you know, a content creation side, you can just download the Unreal Engine, which is free to use, and Unity Engine, you can download the indie version of that and get your hands dirty and play around. Uh, Epic has done some fantastic jobs on uh, the new version of Unreal, you know, which you can simulate uh, and just play at your home, uh, which I have done that myself. So you can get the, you know, the technicality part of the things uh, sorted or knowledge that before you actually go into the production, which is pretty useful. So the tool are accessible and there's a lot of material to learn. You know, there's a good community and Epic provides great support and everything. So, you know, if you have the enthusiastic, you know, things are there for you to grab really. Just going to end by saying thank you so much to Phil for pulling all this together, for Sarah, Alan, Lisa and, and Son. And in the background, yeah. unseen, has been Kevin, who's been making sure everyone's been let in and the tech's working OK. So many thanks to him. And um, yeah, thank you so, so much. And just about one minute over, which isn't bad. But do drop us an email if you want any more information. And thank you. Thank you very much.